Hello and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Disruption Dialogues, a Markets and Markets podcast series for growth-minded strategy, market intelligence, and competitive intelligence professionals. Today, our host Pranjal Sharma is in discussion with Anand Sen Gupta, Vice President Strategy and Joint Functions for Industrial Application Services at Siemens Energy. Welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogues. I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an author based in New Delhi, India, and I'm going to be in discussion with Anand Sen Gupta. Thanks, Anand, for joining us today. Thank you, Pranjal, and hello to everyone. So the topic and the theme for discussion today is decarbonization of the energy sector. It sounds like a very onerous subject, but it's really to ensure how we can continue to consume energy, but reduce and minimize the footprint we have on the ecology. So from the broad perspective, uh, Anand, it seems to be a contradiction in terms, right? That we want to consume energy, but we also don't want to hurt the ecology. So what are the technologies and the overall thinking on this front these days? Yeah, well said, Pranjal. I think uh, it's well known that the energy consumption is not going to reduce uh, anytime soon. It's going to increase. But we also at the same time want to reduce the carbon footprint. And the only way to do that is to reduce the carbon footprint on the generation, transmission, conversion side. When we, for example, have uh, electric cars nowadays, we want to make sure that we're using green electricity there and not getting electricity from uh, coal or other sources. So energy decarbonization yeah, uh, is uh, basically going to happen around how do we really take care of energy generation, getting more of renewables in the mix, and how do we take this renewable energy into our uh, final point of consumption. And this can be done in two ways, right? It could be done by taking those uh, energy, transferring those energy as electrons or electricity, and making sure you're consuming this uh, at the point of use uh, as electricity. But this could also be done as uh, molecules, for example, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol. So really taking green energy, creating these molecules which are still green, they don't have a carbon footprint, that's what the word green means, and making sure that at the point of consumption, we're also completely carbon free or in the mix, you know, having less carbon footprint as we consume this energy. And a good example of this could be the transport sector. Yeah, we have seen how easy it was to move from a gasoline or a petrol car to electric car. Yeah, it's just so natural because we could use, uh, we could tame electricity or electrons much more easily than we could tame uh, molecules and hydrogen and ammonia. And uh, it's much more difficult, you know, in the same way to move from a gasoline car to a hydrogen car because the entire infrastructure has to change, the entire uh, engine has to change. And hence, we see that if I call a broad perspective along the pathway of energy decarbonization of power will be extremely critical and will somehow drive the entire uh, journey towards decarbonization to meet our COP26 targets. I mean, then technologies uh, play a critical role, as you mentioned, but what type of technologies? Is it going to be hardware? Is it going to be new uh, software tools? How are we going to be applying these technologies for these objectives that you laid out? Yeah, again, let's let's talk about, you know, three different aspects here in terms of technologies for energy generation or power generation technologies for conversion of this from one form to another, and technologies that also allow transport from the point of supply to the point of use. So for energy generation, it's largely dominated by the cost of electricity. We call it the levelized cost of electricity. And we have the conventional sources here, like coal, like heavy oils, with very high emissions. And uh, needless to say, we are walking down the path to reduce the usage of coal. But we also have conventional sources like natural gas, which will be a bridge for us. Now, what does that mean? Now, it's very evident that the world will try to consume more and more energy just because we are growing with respect to population, we are growing with respect to our quality of life. And at the same time, we are not fully ready from our infrastructure standpoint to supply that amount of energy. So low footprint fossil fuel like natural gas will serve as a bridge fuel for somehow making us move from today to tomorrow without really losing energy supply in the whole process. And there is a high amount of variability. If you hear some of the um, quarterly reports of the oil and gas companies, we'll hear that between now and 2050, 2070, there is a lot of uh, variability, how much of gas will be used, how much of gas will be in the mix, 
And it all depends on how quickly and how advanced the renewable sources are, how from an economic standpoint they are really becoming cheaper and cheaper and are able to integrate into our daily lives. And of course, there are the usual uh, sources like solar, wind and nuclear. Yeah, and nuclear, we could talk about the uh, small model reactor, which is very new. But there could be things like nuclear fusion. That's how the stars produce power, the holy grail, right? where we could have immense amount of power, infinite power with zero carbon footprint. And all of these will shape how from today to tomorrow, the role of the conventional fuels change and how the price or the evidence cost of electricity is going to impact that uh, generation. Moving on to energy conversion, there could be two ways for this. One would be conversion from power in one form, for example, electricity from a hydroelectric plant at uh, maybe 220K volts, right? into power in another, for example, in a battery in an electric car. And this conversion, we probably have uh, somehow perfected the electricity conversion efficiencies, but this does play a role when you're talking about large amounts of megawatts getting converted. And here we'll see slowly and steadily better and better efficiencies as we go forward. And we'll also see that larger amount of power is getting converted at higher efficiencies and this will be critical from an overall energy efficiency and cost of electricity standpoint at the point of use. Then we have the molecular pathway. One of them is moving from energy in terms of electricity to heat. There is a lot of heat that is generated as a byproduct of a lot of power generation. And taking this heat, using chillers to really use this heat to cool some areas, there is something called heat pump. It's the refrigerator working backwards. We can basically scale up this heat to be used in industrial processes, or we could just use this heat for district heating in cold countries. And that would give a lot of efficiency to the whole process because you're not wasting the heat and warming the air, but rather using the heat to, to do something more useful and, and consuming it. And the third one is definitely the power to some other form of hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, some other molecule. And here we already see that hydrogen is going to be a basis, a molecule that can be used so that we can store the energy in form of a chemical energy and later release it at the point of use, for example, in transport, in chemical industry like green ammonia and in other process industries. Yeah, so we will see that this energy conversion will play an important role. And the third point is the energy transport. And here economics will definitely play a role as well as the factors like safety. Can I transport hydrogen over long distances or policies? You know, would I somehow tax a carbon footprint higher than my neighboring country? Yeah, these will play a very important role connecting the globe like we have today if you're carrying LNG will a low carbon LNG versus a high carbon LNG, LNG that has been produced with electricity, for example, as a power to compress the gas, will that be bought at a higher price? Will that be incentivized somehow so that we are hurting the climate lesser than traditional ways? All of these will play a role in making sure that we are advancing the technologies at the same time, improving the carbon footprint that is used in generating, converting or transporting the energy from one point to another. So it's combination of technologies and the fuel mix. You know, you refer to the whole piece about transport and mobility. And what I find interesting, especially in emerging markets and, and developed markets about the shift towards electric vehicles. Now, there is an argument that effectively what we are doing is that we are taking away the uh, footprint of uh, biofuels from individual vehicles to a collective power generation units. So the load and the demand on power generation units will increase because you need that much more generation to be able to charge the electric batteries. So therefore, can technology help us understand the net impact and therefore how to decarbonize? So, Pranjal, I see that uh, there are two factors playing a role here. One is the economics of scale. Producing, converting power at a very low scale of few kilowatts versus doing the same at few megawatts or gigawatts. Economics of scale play a very important role in driving efficiency. And that typically relates to how much of carbon footprint is associated with that one unit of power. The second part is that if we see how urbanization is somehow becoming a very important trend, if I produce carbon locally in a car and distribute it over miles of the city, it's much harder to sequester that carbon than producing that carbon in a remote facility, in a power plant, 
uh, in a very concentrated manner and then sequestering it back into the earth, right? So I think both of these play a role in reducing the footprint just because we can manage the carbon better and also because the efficiencies are higher when we do something at a bigger scale. At your company, uh, Anand, what kind of innovation is happening? What are the new uh, breakthrough approaches and technologies being applied at Siemens? Yes, so there are two ways uh, to answer this. One is the traditional uh, element where we are trying to constantly improve the efficiency of our power generation equipment of our energy conversion equipment and I would not talk so much about it because that's uh, that's been done for the last you know, 30 40 years anyhow uh, we are reaching some breakthrough now but I think more importantly we are extremely aggressive in moving into the new energy markets which we call uh, the green energy uh, the blue hydrogen and here there are some great examples one of the examples we have connected to a consortium yeah the consortium with ng solutions with centrax and german aerospace center a few universities together we are actually showing at an industrial scale how we could generate hydrogen from a wind farm yeah at an industrial scale use that in a gas turbine again at an industrial scale to produce power and deliver that completely green power yeah, to a consumption network, right? That's something we are doing already uh, in France and uh, we are very proud of that. Other than that, we are also having some other examples, for example, in Dubai uh, with DEWA, which is the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority and Expo 2020. We have the first industrial scale hydrogen project in Middle East and Asia. We are producing hydrogen yeah, in here and that would actually help Dubai to reach the lowest carbon footprint in the world by 2050. We're also seeing uh, that uh, large scale production is important yeah, and we have a demonstrator plant uh, in Chile in Haru Oni where we are having a 2 gigawatt wind farm that is connected to e-methanol production facility which is again completely green fuel and will change the landscape of how e-methanol production is done over the world. And we have some other examples, for example, green hydrogen for steel in Austria, as you know, the steel industry has a large carbon footprint and we are changing that as we speak. We have a large scale e-methanol project in Denmark. Uh, yeah, we are tying up with a shipping company because all the ships that actually consume quite CO2 intensive fuel and with e-methanol will make the ships also quite green, at least greener than how they are today. So there are many projects we're working on. We also have the electrolyzer, electrolysis as one of the key areas we're working on with our cylinder electrolyzer. So there are some examples, I would say, um, moving from the pilot scale to industrial scale and maybe tomorrow to a large industrial scale, which can help uh, supply green power due to the business as well. I don't, it also appears that the approach cannot be the same, perhaps depending on the level of technologies, usage, energy fuel mix, what you would apply in a, one market may not be relevant in the other. And what works in Germany may not work in Greece and may not work in US or in uh, Vietnam or in India. So how is this decarbonization as a movement? How delegated will it be? How fragmented would it be? How local would it be? Great question, Pranjola. This is something I strongly believe that we need to pay attention because it's not a clear straight line to reach the COP26 goals. What will play a role, of course, is the landed cost of the alternative fuel. Yeah? So if I talk about countries where the natural gas price or the price of oil is already high, right, and the alternative fuel is coming in as even higher, if you have a different adoption rate than countries where the cost of gas is quite low and the alternative fuel is quite high. So the economics of the landed cost of fuel, the availability of these alternative fuel will play a role, whether it's high or low, in driving adoption. On the other side, if you also see the CO2 taxation regime, how much of CO2 taxation from a regulation standpoint are driven in Europe versus North America versus India, they're quite different. And the regulations, the social acceptance will play an important role in driving our consumption from a CO2 unfriendly to a CO2 friendly energy source. Yeah, And I see that there could be countries where we have a very low change in fuel cost if we use the alternative fuel, but the CO2 taxes are so high, there would be early adopters of green fuels. And you could see that in Europe already, 
Well, there are pilots today, they are scaling up. We're also seeing a lot of government grants and subsidies in doing that. On the other hand, there are countries where the landed cost of fuel, the alternative fuel is quite high. And the regulations are not very strong yet yeah, because of uh, maybe many other reasons. And there we would probably see slow acceptance. And this is where incentives and subsidies are needed to really put some more social pressure, and moral pressure and economic pressure to move forward. And then we have the other two countries where also, you know, either it's a low, low case where the CO2 taxation is low and the alternative fuel is also quite inexpensive. And here, for example, EOE and USA, where it will be a mixed bag. But I think the moral social incentive, even the political power, corporate vision will play an important role. And the other place where both from a zero taxation, it's quite high, the cost of fuel is quite high, like UK, we need to shift that balance. We need to shift that balance by, from a societal standpoint, from a political standpoint, by really a little more activism and making sure we're not hurting the world as we consume more energy and more power. I don't know, this is very fascinating. Finally, I'd like to discuss and talk about what you have been doing. You're a domain expert and of course, your expertise is not limited to energy. But in terms of your effort and your personal vision for where you think it is headed and how you see yourself playing an important role in this. Interesting question. I think I tie it back to our company's vision, which I really like. We energize society. We could talk about the consumption part where we are trying to make sure we are consuming more green energy. So as a person, I do that in my own private life. But as a company, we try to also move towards supporting green initiatives much more than we did in the past. That's one. But what I really also like is the power of technology, but more important, the power of collaboration with which you can drive some of these topics around efficiencies of conversion, around the aspects of transportation, safety of transportation, or even scaling up pilots to industrial to utility. And these are places where we are doing a lot of projects. I, I support these projects. I think uh, it's important that we are not always we are putting our purpose before our economics at times to make something work, and then moving on to the financial economic side of the project. So we are doing that quite a lot. And I like it because uh, I, I, I see that we are saving the world for our children. I think that's, uh, that's a very important, uh, noble objective. And, you know, it is in many ways in our self-interest to make that effort. It may sound painful right now, but the effort and investment required to decarbonize is really to make our world and our Earth a better place to live. So with that, I'd like to bring to an end our discussion, Anand. Really excited to hear what you said. And I'm sure that there's far more that you are doing than we have been able to capture in this conversation. But I think what's, what's very clear is that energy is just one of the sectors, uh, but it is a critical sector. So if we are able to decarbonize energy, I think the cascading effect on other industries and sectors would be very high. So thank you for joining us today. It was wonderful to talk and uh, thank you for having me and I look forward to yeah, future interactions. Thank you very much. To all of you who are listening, thanks for joining in. I was in conversation with Anand Sen Gupta, Vice President Strategy and Joint Functions for Industrial Application Services at Siemens Energy. We'll be back soon with another episode of Disruption Dialogues. Until then, goodbye. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Disruption Dialogues. If you are a strategy or market intelligence professional, we invite you to join our community on LinkedIn, Hashtag Disruption Dialogues.